Reading with your kids. Hola, Niho, Konnichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Mahaba, Moi Miliwanji, Namaste, Jumbo, Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the Crowded Mattress Studios, our temporary home here in the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville, in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored that you'll join us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find your podcasts. And please tell all of your family and friends about the show. Our guest today is Dr. Claire Rubman. She is here to celebrate this may be difficult to read. Before we invite Dr. Claire into the studio, we want to invite you to connect with us on social media, facebook.com slash reading with your kids, at reading with your kids on Instagram, at Jedly Magic on Twitter. Of course, we would love for you to visit our reading with your kids page on YouTube. You can find all the episodes of the reading with your kids podcast there and much, much more. We would also love for you to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. You can click on the contact button up at the top of the page. Let us know what we're doing well. Let us know what we could be doing better. And let us know who you would like to hear on a future episode of the podcast. Join us right now from the beautiful island of Long. Well, that sounds weird. It's Long Island in New York. Our guest is here today to celebrate a great book for parents and educators. It's called... This may be difficult to read. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Claire Rubman. Dr. Claire, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me on the show today. Uh, you're, you're very welcome. I'm excited to have you on, and I, I can't wait for you to tell us all about what this may be difficult to read is all about. What are we going to find difficult to read? <laughs> well, it, it may be the truth that we find difficult to read. Ah. Um, it's a book for parents and it's designed to help parents and any educators that might be interested in reading it because we have a few missing steps in the reading comprehension process. And the book is designed to help parents who want the best for their children but don't necessarily know that they're missing out on these vital steps. That's really fascinating, um, and I really want to dive into this with you. My my beautiful wife is a, uh, a just retired teacher. Spent thirty four years teaching in the Boston public schools, and uh, that was one of her real focuses. Was not only um, helping her special needs teacher students learn how to read, but more importantly, learn how to comprehend what it was that they're reading because you and I obviously know you can sound out the words, but if you're not understanding what you're reading, you're really kind of not reading. Right. That's exactly the premise of the book. And so parents lead these frenetic lives these days, whether you're a single parent family or a two income family, um, parents want to educate their children. They want to go to work and come home again. They want a social life. And so this book is designed to fit reading into a parent's daily routine without adding any unnecessary load. And the idea, as you just said, is that it's not enough to learn to say the letters and sounds or even to read the words out loud, but we need to teach our children how to comprehend the written word. So we teach our children to hear, but we also teach them to listen to what's being said. And so in the same way, we want to teach our children to read, but also to understand what they're reading. So the book is based on the premise that we have probably over 50 years of research. It's just sitting there in journals, and it's time that parents really got their hands on it. It's time that parents understood that there's so much they can do at home as a natural part of their daily routine. Again, they naturally teach their children to listen and hear, so they should naturally be able to teach their children to read and understand what they're reading. You know, it's interesting you're talking about um, hearing as opposed to just listening. And one of the, the observations that I made when my son was younger and him and his buddies would be in the back of my van and we'd be going somewhere and they'd be talking and 
uh, I was really surprised one day to observe that these kids were all taking turns talking, but no one was listening to each other. <laughs> they, they, all they were listening for was the breath, that pause that meant, oh, it's time for me to jump in here. Right. We got that parallel speech, but that's a whole nother book. <laughs> and so the, the idea with this may be difficult to read is that it's difficult for parents to maybe accept the fact that they could do more or not know that there is more to be done because we as adults take reading for granted, right? We know, as you said before, we know how to read. And so because we've automated the process, it means that we're not necessarily the best teachers because we don't necessarily remember the steps that we went through in order to read. Just like we can ride the bicycles and we don't necessarily remember how long and arduous the task was in order to find that balancing point. And so this may be difficult to read, um, allows parents to read from a child's perspective. So it's fabulous research, not my research, but it's fabulous research that shows us um, if there's a, could I read a passage in the book and give an example? Absolutely. Okay, so um, for example, um, children need background knowledge in order to understand a text. And that's easy to say, but we as adults usually have that background knowledge. Unless we pick up like a physics textbook and we're not experts in physics, we don't necessarily have this daily experience. And so Shank and Abelson, and this is back in 1975, they took the time and trouble to give us a passage that would allow us to understand what children experience when they don't have background knowledge. So I'll read the passage and then we can talk about it. It's on page 100 of the book. Jim went to the restaurant and asked to be seated in the gallery. He was told that there would be a half hour wait. 40 minutes later, the applause for his song indicated that he could proceed with the preparation. 20 guests had ordered his favourite a cheese souffle. Jim enjoyed the customers in the main dining room. After two hours, he ordered the house speciality, roast pheasant under glass. It was incredible to enjoy such exquisite cuisine and yet still have $15. He would surely come back soon. So now, <laughs> if we go through this, right, Jim, well, you know, Jim's a man's name. It's possible we know someone called Jim. He went to the restaurant. That's fine too. And he asked to be seated in the gallery. So at that point, we're probably thinking, gallery? Well, she has an unusual accent. Maybe they have galleries, whatever she's from. He was told there would be a one half hour wait. Well, that's no big deal for any of us, right? We all know about waiting in restaurants. And then the fun begins. So 40 minutes later, the applause for his song. So what song? What applause? He's in a restaurant. And so you can see already how hard we're working in order to understand this story. And then it seems to go off the rails. 20, 20 guests had ordered his favorite, a cheese souffle. Like, what's that about? Jim enjoyed the customers in the main dining room. And so you can see that nothing's really coming together. Mm -hmm. And so the point that Shank enables him, well, there's two points. One point is look how hard we work in order to bring background information to the story. But also, if you don't have the background knowledge, what are you doing with all of the information? And so the point here is that, you know, parents need to be doing activities with their children and relating them right back to books. So if you go outside in the snow today and you, you know, you make a snowman or you have a snowball fight, find a corresponding book at the library that relates to exactly that so that children know how to bring the knowledge to the story, read the story and relate what you did to the story in the book. So that's one example. The other example in the book, and again, this is fabulous research. It's by Bransford and Johnson and it's from 1972. And again, the reason that I wrote the book, um, you asked me that earlier, the reason I wrote the book was because why would we do all of this fantastic research if we're not sharing it with anybody? It's time to share the information. The educators, you said your wife was a, you know, taught in the public schools in Boston. Educators know this. This book is validation for good educators, but for parents and through no fault of their own, they don't necessarily understand the underpinnings of the reading comprehension process. And so all of this research, since it's sitting there anyway, why don't we utilize it? It just seems like it's time. Mm -hmm. So if it's okay with you, I could give you another example. Absolutely. So sometimes children have the background knowledge. Parents are fabulous at taking their children to different adventures and museums and walking in the park and pointing out all kinds of great things. But sometimes we don't know which information to link to which story. So Bransford and the Bransford and Johnson story, um, you have to know which information to bring with you. 
Uh, so this is on page 113 of the book. The procedure is actually quite simple. First, you arrange items into different groups. Of course, one pile may be sufficient, depending on how much there is to do. If you have to go somewhere else due to lack of facilities, that's the next step. Otherwise, you're pretty well set. It's important not to overdo things. That is, it's better to do a few things at once than too many. In the short run, this may not seem important, but complications could easily arise. A mistake can be expensive as well. At first, the whole procedure will seem complicated. Soon, however, it will become just another facet of life. It is difficult to foresee any end to the necessity for this task in the immediate future, but then one can never tell. So now if I asked your listeners to um, write down anything they can remember from that passage, they'd probably get a few things at the end or maybe a couple in the middle. But the point here is that it, it seems like a bizarre story. Mm-hmm. If I just read it one more time, but I add one thing, which is the title, look at the difference. The washing clothes passage. The procedure is actually quite simple. First, you arrange items into different groups. Of course, one pile may be sufficient, depending on how much there is to do. If you have to go somewhere else due to lack of facilities, that's the next step. Otherwise, you're pretty well set. So I won't read the whole thing, but you can see that just by telling you that it's about a washing clothes passage, you can then bring everything you know about washing clothes to the story. And that was Bransford and Frank's point that unless we point out to children which information they need in order to read, really, it's useless having the information because they don't necessarily know to access it. And so those are two examples of things that parents can do within their daily routine and within the things that they usually do with their children anyway. But by specifically mentioning them and practicing these skills, we can improve children's reading comprehension skills. So so tell us, other than sitting down and, and reading these examples and saying, well, I read the first one first and what did that that mean it's like I don't know pile the pile the type and and then use it you know put the title in there now suddenly the kids understand it um what can we do in our day-to-day lives that can help our kids develop comprehension is it something that we we need to continue to read with our kids as they're growing older and ask them questions about what it is they're reading or are there things that we can do when while we're walking through a supermarket or doing doing the laundry at home that can help them with their comprehension? Well, uh, that's a great question. All of the above. Uh, We want to create a need to read in our home. So in the same way that children have a need to communicate and talk, we want to develop a a a print-rich environment so that children have a need to write and a need to read. So putting name tags at the table. um, For younger children, you can label the environment. So we call them phonetically friendly words. So anything that spells the way it sounds, like rug, 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 we can put a little sign on the rug that says it's a rug. Door's a little harder because that would be dear, <laughs> but still, we can label the environment. We can send notes to each other. You can put a little note, just a simple note, even one word in a child's lunchbox if they go out, you know, if they're at childcare or they're going to school. Um, and within the daily routine, make books a part of our daily life make reading an important aspect of what our children do. So if you're going to cook dinner, which you're doing anyway, pick out a recipe or write the simple instructions for a recipe so that children can read, but they have a need to read. They have to be able to follow the instruction in order to get to the next step. I have a friend whose granddaughter's birthday is coming up and she made little clues on cards. So the child reads the clue and then goes to the next location to try and find the birthday present. So anything that involves comprehension, anything where you need to read, will encourage reading comprehension skills. Of course, if a child has difficulty reading, that's going to be a problem. But if we put the fun and the adventure into reading, um, so the book starts with 10 myths or facts about reading. And one of them is this idea that we mistakenly believe, some people mistakenly believe that if we tell our children, if we read to our children, it's not the same as our children reading to us. But the truth of the matter is, no matter where the words are coming from, the comprehension skills are still the same. So if we can lighten the cognitive load by reading the words to our children, we're still practicing the comprehension part, which is really, really important because these need to go hand in hand. And often parents will say, well, I'll just teach my child the letters and sounds and somebody else can do the rest later. 
But the problem with that is that then we don't necessarily know that we're extracting meaning from a printed word. We want to do that right from the start. We want simple books with short, you know, short sentences. Um, we talk about proposition integration, this idea that um, each proposition or each idea unit has to be joined to the next one. That's how we make sense of stories. We build a story in our head. And so we want to encourage children with small propositions and teach them how to integrate them. So that's why notes are a great idea. That's why puzzles are a great idea. And that's why just sitting down and reading with your children will encourage them to build that story in their head. And we can anticipate what's coming next. And there's so many fabulous books out there. Any book is great. Read anything with your children. Comics, magazines, recipes. But some of the classics are so much fun to read. And you can guess it. If you're reading Anne of Green Gables, it's a chapter book. So some children might be scared off by that. But it's such a universal story of what did you do? And what do we do now that you've got green hair? How do we fix it? And so, you know, it brings up so many issues and it's fun, it's exciting. It brings up conversations between parents and children that may not necessarily have been had if we hadn't read the story. So, you know, it makes it fun. Make reading fun in your house. Yeah, yeah. And if you read Anne of Green Gables, make sure you visit Prince Edward Island in Canada because the whole <laughs> island is dedicated to Anne. <laughs> Everywhere you go, there's a little Anne of Green Gables. It's kind of creepy. Uh, you, you mentioned, Dr. Claire, about you know writing little notes to our kids, um, and that is something that I used to do with with my kids. Is put a little note in their lunchbox. I love you. Have a great day. That that kind of thing. And it seems, on the one hand, that in in today's world of telephones and text messages, that we are sending each other these quick little notes and little messages. Um, via technology, but I don't know, a lot of the notes and the text messages that I get don't actually qualify as English, and it's really hard <laughs> kind of figure. and there's a lot of times I can't figure out what it is a pe person's trying to tell me. Do you think that um, the devices that, that, we're, that we and our kids are on all the time, is it, do you think it's it's helping. I, I know it can help, but do you think it's helping kids develop their comprehension at this time, or is it something we're not using correctly? Well, from a cognitive perspective, we have active participation and we have passive engagement. And so if we're watching something on a screen, that's passive, and it doesn't involve us cognitively processing in the same way that active participation does. So the idea behind actually writing a note and putting it in your child's lunchbox would be that the note would then lead to something else at home. Um, hopefully children don't have technology with them in school. Hopefully they're focused on their work in school. And so it's moving away from technology and just making it so much more personal. Bring the note home with you and then go and search for whatever the note said on it. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, make it into an adventure where it's all hands-on manipulation. The truth of the matter is, and... You know, Piaget taught us this in the 1950s. Jean Piaget said that children don't think like adults. They don't think the way we do. So we may be impressed by technology, but children need hands-on manipulation of the environment. They need to touch. They need to feel, not the keyboard. They need to actually feel the paper. They need to touch the toys. They need to actively engage in their environment, and that's how they learn. So whilst technology has a place in education, and whilst technology has a place in an adult's life, in early childhood in particular, we want to keep it hands-on and face-to-face -face and one-to-one -one participation so that we can actively engage with our children as they actively manipulate the environment. Yeah. You know, one of the things you said earlier on was that there are a lot of parents, for very good reasons, we're all super busy and we're doing a thousand and, and one things. And so there are a lot of parents who take the attitude that, uh, okay, I'll teach the kids what the letters are and the sounds they make, but I'll leave it to the professionals to teach them how to comprehend that. And uh, my wife will tell you that there are a lot of parents these days who won't even do the teaching the kids the, the letters part of it. And it's such as all, you're, you're the teacher and you do it. I, for one, I remember having a conversation with my 
daughter's second grade teacher, my, my son started reading. I mean, he was reading when he was four, and he didn't let me know until, we, you know, his kindergarten <laughs> teacher came home, and it, you know, came up to me and said, hey, your kid's reading. And I'm like, wait a minute. I have to read to him all the time. And she's, she's like, well, that's great. And in second grade, my, you know, my daughter wasn't struggling. She was do, doing very well. But, but uh, her teacher came up to me and said, you know, make sure you continue to read with her. And I said, but she's reading independently right now. Aren't I supposed to let her do that? And he's like, yeah, but she can do it with you and you can take turns. And that made me so happy. The idea that, oh, I, 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 I now have permission to continue to be part of my daughter's education. And I, I took that as license to um, butt my nose into every part of their their education ongoing all the way through high school, well, all the way through college, <laughs> which I'm sure they didn't appreciate. But uh, any parent that's out there, it's like being part of your kid's education is, it's such a joy for one thing. And it's also something, you know, we're raising our kids and we want to instill certain values in our kids. And the way we do that is by being part of their education and helping them read, helping them comprehend things um, and, and helping them comprehend things with the values that are important to us. And the only way that happens is if we stay involved in their education and don't hand it off to somebody else. Well, absolutely. You make so many wonderful points. Um, I'm glad your children enjoy reading. <laughs> and I'm glad you got to enjoy the journey with them. Um, that's another thing I touch on on the book. Look, we're parents, and these are our children. So clearly it's a partnership between parents and educators so that we can bring out the best in our children. But sometimes as parents, we look to the end goal instead of enjoying the journey. We want to enjoy the process of encouraging them to learn to read and enjoy every step of the journey. As they learn to talk, we get so excited with the first mama or dada. Um, Whatever it is that they, you know, they do when they score their first goal, when they balance on a balance beam, whatever it is they do. Uh, but we have to learn to enjoy the process. That's what's important, not the end result or the outcome. You know, <laughs> there's this concept of participation trophies. Mm -hmm. I mean, listen, it's great to participate and it's great to get a trophy, but let's focus on what's important. We want to get to know our children. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to get to know the child that you have. Not the child you wish you had, but the child you actually have. And not every day is going to be golden. And not every child is going to win every award. Mm -hmm. It's about trying their best, doing their best, and seeing what makes your child unique and, and special to you. So not every child is going to Harvard. Not every child has to go to Harvard. There's not enough room in Harvard for every child. But rather, let's focus on the journey of enjoying the sixness of six or the eightness of eight. Whatever age they are, enjoy that particular moment because you never get it back. Mm -hmm. And whilst we're rushing to work and rushing home and rushing to prepare dinner and throwing the clothes in the washing machine, whatever it is we're doing, each day ticks by. And of course, <laughs> I'm older now, so my children have all left home. But the, the last part of the book talks about my youngest. In fact, if I could read it to you, sure. it sort of encapsulates what we're talking about. Certainly, this is page 219. Certainly no one ever said that parenting was easy. No one ever said that teaching was easy either. When parents try to teach, it can become doubly, a doubly frustrating experience. I hope that this book has shed some light on some of the difficulties that children experience as, as they navigate a path that has become second nature for us. Remember that they are not like us. Their brains are wired differently. They think differently. They process information differently. If you want to succeed, learn to think as they think. Learn to process information as they process information. As I say goodbye to my last child and wave him, to be, wave him off to begin his university experience, I urge you to remember that it's a journey that takes 18 long years. If you fixate on the outcome, the payoff, the final product, then it will be a bittersweet moment when you say your goodbyes. Try instead to enjoy the journey, the mistakes, the learning curves, and those precious moments. Let your children lead and learn to follow. Good luck and enjoy each moment of your journey. 
You know, Dr. Claire, it sounds like you are in agreement with something that we've been saying here on the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Something I said to my kids when they were young and in kindergarten, uh, we chose to send our kids to Catholic school for a number of different reasons, and it cost, it was an investment. And we, we told our kids that there wasn't going to be a big pile of, of cash for them to go to college, that they were going to have to work hard and get a scholarship, and that we were investing in them now, not only with our, with our treasure, but with our time. And so we spent a lot of time with our kids. And I was right. There wasn't a big pile of cash for them to go to college. Uh, but they managed, and, and we managed, and they made some, some really wise choices in the universities that, that they chose to attend. Um, and, and so I say to parents out there, make the investment your time today. Invest your time in your kid there's no need to work 80, 90 hours a week so that you have that big, giant pot of gold at the end of their high school years to go to college. Because, listen, college is here. You mentioned Harvard. Harvard's seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars a year right now. By the time your kid gets to to, to college, and by you know college age, if they're five years old right now, it's going to be about three or four million dollars a year to go to. Harvard at the rate it is. So you're never going to be able to save all that money. Invest in your kids. Enjoy the time with them. They're going to benefit from it so much more than, you know, not knowing you, but knowing that you have this big bundle of money for them to go to college. Absolutely. You're so right. And in fact, there's research out there. Um, I believe it's from the Kaiser Institute. Um, they interview children and ask them, what do you want? And the number one thing that children seem to want was time with their parents. But actual time, not time when their parents are texting or time when their parents are working at the you know simultaneously, but just dedicated, uninterrupted time, because that's the one thing that children seem to lack nowadays. Mm -hmm. And it's not a parent's fault. You know, we work. You know, it used to be back in the day there were two parents, one would work, the other would stay home and raise the children. But now, you know. Children spend more time in aftercare. They spend more time in pre-care. Summer camps, they're off doing, you know, activities because parents have to work. And so we want to find that dedicated time, as you said, just to be with our children. Some of my children's fondest memories are the summers that we had together. You know, boredom is the greatest thing for a child. If your child sits around at some, in summer or, you know, on the weekends saying, I'm bored, that's fantastic. Because out of boredom comes creativity. Mm -hmm. Out of boredom comes an interest in the environment and an interest in learning. If we constantly schedule our children, which, of course, is a whole different book, but if we constantly schedule our children, when is their time to figure out who they are? Mm -hmm. So when is their time to step up and become a leader, to step up and become an independent thinker? So we used to have days in the summer where we would have um, parent for the day, because one day my children, back then there were two children, but one would, they would say, how come you get to make all the rules? And I'd say, well, I don't make the rules. Society makes the rules. So that didn't make sense. You know, they were five and six years old. I said, all right, you be the parent. You take charge for the day. So we would do that. It became like a, 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 an annual event. So they would become parent for the day. They would make all the decisions. And at the end of the day, they were so happy to step back into being five, six, or seven. But it gave them an opportunity to have fun. And those are the things they remember. Mm -hmm. You know, going hiking. Like I used to take them home to Scotland every year, and we'd go hiking in the north of Scotland. There's nothing there except hills and sheep. <laughs> so you just kind of have to have fun with each other. And those are the memories that they build because it's time. It's time with your parents where we get to know them, they get to know us, and I think it begins to shape their character. Yeah. So investing in your children emotionally um, and giving them the time of day really goes such a long way to make them the upstanding people that we hope they'll grow into. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Claire, I know this is such an important book, and I know parents are going to want to know where they can go to find out more about that book. And more about you. Oh, well, the book's available on Amazon. And there's a website. It's called difficulttoread.com with a two instead of T-O, the number two. Um, and you can find out all about me on the website or on Amazon. There's a about the author. Uh -huh. um, I teach at Suffolk County Community College. Um, I've been there for over 20 years. I love teaching. I teach child psychology adolescent psychology, anything that ends in psychology, I teach it. <laughs> awesome, awesome. 
And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because, parents, if you are listening out there and your kids are in high school and they're approaching and they're getting all this pressure from their high school teachers and counselors, well, you know, need to go to Harvard, you need to go to Cornell, you need to go to these big-name schools, sit down with your kids and say, you know what, you can go to community college first two years, get yourself all that information, the same classes you're going to take at Harvard and Cornell and all those places, you're going to spend a, a, a fraction of the money, and then you're going to enter those universities as a junior, and you're going to come out uh, with a degree and with so much less debt, and you're going to be happier. Absolutely. You know, community colleges are just a jewel in each community, and I really wish people re really understood what goes on there because we as professors at community colleges, we're dedicated to teaching. We don't take time out to do research. We're in the classroom every single day. And the classes at Suffolk, the classes of 35 students as a maximum in each class. So you get, you know, dedicated attention from your college professors and it can make such a difference. And, you know, when you're 18, 19, you don't necessarily know what you want to do with the rest of your life. So it's a fabulous way to explore different options. And I do encourage young people to explore their options because oftentimes we kind of fall into a job or we fall into a major. But rather than doing that, explore and decide what you want. Choose what you want instead of allowing life to happen or pass you by. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, Dr. Claire, I think you and I could do a whole episode on <laughs> benefits of community college and <laughs> uh, and and just because kids are there's so much pressure on kids to to follow the stream that everybody's going down and go to that elite name college, even if it's gonna mean that you come out of college owing one hundred fifty two hundred thousand dollars, and it's it's just not necessary. It's um, the people who are encouraging you to do that are uh, looking out for their best interests and not necessarily necessarily your kids. Well, I think it also guides parents. You know, if you want to be on a travel team for a sport, that's great. Be on a travel team. But I was listen. I'm a foreigner, but I first came here and my son like I wanted him to play soccer because that's my national sport in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Well, we call it football, but that's another story. But um, you know, I wanted him to play soccer just so that when he went home, he'd be able to play a sport with his cousins. We'd have a sport in common. And so <laughs> I was always so surprised that parents would be so fixated on these travel teams because it seemed like there were more children playing soccer right there in my neighborhood than in the entire country of Scotland. So why would we need to travel to play soccer somewhere else? And slowly over the course of time, I realized these are resume building experiences but that's not what childhood should be. Mm -hmm. Childhood should be let your child lead and you should follow. Don't push your child into doing something to win the award, to win the trophy, to get something on the resume, because your child will shine naturally and you'll see your child's natural procl proclivities when you allow the child to lead. Instead of pushing them into, you know, science this or STEM that, let them decide what they're interested in. Let them try it out. But don't force them into things that will be good for their college application because that's not what life's about. Mm -hmm. Sometimes at community colleges, we have students who fail at the four-year level. And one of the reasons that they seem to fail is because the focus in high school was to get to college. But once they got to college, what did they do then? We want to raise exciting, interesting children who are keen to learn and desperate to explore so that when they get to university, they're looking around to learn as much as they can and gain as much from that college experience. We don't want exhausted freshmen who don't know what to do with themselves because, well, high school's over. What's the next step? Yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> We've had a great time speaking to the author of This May Be Difficult to Read. Our guest has been the author, Dr. Claire Rubman. Dr. Claire, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guests will be the Pumphrey brothers, Jared and Jerome. They'll be here to celebrate Link and HUD heroes by a hair. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we want to start by thanking our guest, Dr. Claire Rubman. Please be sure to check out This May Be Difficult to Read. 
I also want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Jordan Saley, Will Cheever, Cassandra Masonet, Stephanie Davila. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. I want to thank my son, Christopher, for being here to help us during this time. I also want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.